that's question time for the end. Questions? <laughs> Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam President. My question with that notice, which some is given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Premier. One, has Lottery West received any training from the Equal Opportunity Commission since March 2017? Two, yes to one, on what dates and which employees and or board members received the training? Leader of the House. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One, no. Two, not applicable. Leader of the Opposition. None of them estimates, but never mind. Radio question with that notice, which some notice is given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Planning. Uh, I refer to the single access roads to Gracetown in the south west and I ask one, what fire uh, management plan is in place to ensure residents have an alternative uh, way to exit the town in case of a fire emergency this summer? Two, are, any plans for a second, uh, for a, are there any plans for a second access road? If not, why not? Three, if yes to two, at what stage of the plans will that way they be finalised? And four, what other options, if any, are being considered? Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some knowledge of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Planning. One, a fire management plan is the responsibility of the local government. Two, yes. Three to four, six alignment options have been considered for Gracetown. The recommended option of a 4,400 metre north-south inland road that extends from Salter Street to Ellenbrook Road Ellen Brook Road has the endorsement of the steering group. It is not, however, supported by the Shire of Augusta Margaret River, who opposed it for environmental reasons. The Shire has resolved not to endorse the recommendation. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, President, and, um, my question, of which some notice has been given, is directed to the Leader of the House representing the Attorney General. Given that the position of full-time Commissioner of the Corruption and Crime Commission has been vacant since 28 April this year because the government had chosen not to appoint either of the two candidates recommended by the Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption and Crime Commission as suitable for appointment, one, to what extent has the lack of a full-time Commissioner significantly disrupted or compromised operational activities? Two, provide evidence to support those assertions. Three, have you since April asked for or received any further reports from the Commission of its ongoing ongoing or emerging investigations, and if so, when and for what purpose? And four, have any investigations pursued when the Honourable John McEchnie QC retired as Commissioner been discontinued or compromised solely by reason of his not having been reappointed, and if so, why? Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. Uh, I do thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question, but I am astonished that you would want to be asking about the Triple C today. Um, one to four. The government continues to support the Honourable John McKechnie QC, who was considered by the nominating committee to be the outstanding candidate for the role of Commissioner of the Corruption and Crime Commission. Order. Given his integrity and professional experience, including the roles of Director of Public Prosecutions, a senior judge of the Supreme Court of Western Australia, and most recently as Commissioner of the Triple C. The nominating committee comprised the Chief Justice of Western Australia Australia, the Chief Judge of the District Court and a Community Representative. The Government, in its dealings with the Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption and Crime Commission and the Liberal Party on this critical appointment, maintains its strong support for Mr McKechnie QC. The Honourable you, you are tone order. Deaf. Order. Order. I would really like to give the call to the Honourable Donna Farragher, who I'm sure has got a very interesting question to pose. The Honourable Donna Farragher. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, my question without notice, of which some notice has are we ready? Mm. Um, has been given is to the minister representing the Minister for Lands. I refer to the former Swan District Hospital site and I ask, can the, minister conf can the minister confirm the government's intent for the future of this site and does it impact on the application previously lodged with the City of Swan to rezone the site from public purpose hospital to special use residential R60 private clubs and public open space? Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Uh, I just uh, draw your attention to the fact that this was asked on the 11th of November, so it's current as at that date. So I, I'm aware of some changes since then. Uh, the former Swan District Hospital site has been committed to the Noongar uh, Budget Trust as part of the Noongar Land Estate under the South West Native Title Settlement on the basis it seeks to deliver an aged care outcome on portion of the site. This does not, not impact the application previously lodged with the City of Swan. Honourable Nick Garan. Madam President, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for the Environment representing the Treasurer. I refer to answer to question without notice number 1267, and I ask one, 
Why is the $291.1 million funded in legal fees not being recouped from the Bell litigation settlement sum and retained or repaid to the Insurance Commission of Western Australia? Two, of the $665.4 million received by ICWA, how much is being paid to the government? And three, further to two, by what statutory mechanism, please name the section of the Act, is ICWA lawfully able to pay this specific sum to the government? Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam mm -hmm. President. I thank the honourable member for some notes of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Treasurer. One, the amount spent on the Bell litigation were expressed. The amount spent uh, on the Bell litigation was expressed. It was expensed in each year. The costs were incurred. Uh, in determining dividends to be transferred to government, the Insurance Commission's board takes into account its net profit after tax, solvency and capital adequacy requirements. Tax payments are made in line with the national tax equivalent regime. Two, $655.4 million is expected to be paid to the government. Three, sections 28 and 29 of the Insurance Commission of Western Australia Act 1986 and the national tax equivalent regime provide the mechanisms for the payment of dividends and tax equivalent payments. The Honourable Jackie Boydell. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Minister for Regional Development. I refer to an article published by WA Today on the 25th of November titled Prison Officer Suspended Over Fraud Allegations Gets a $100,000 Government Grant for Pilbara Tours. And I ask one, will the Minister explain the local and government due diligence process for checking the accountability and credibility of the applicants for regional economic development grants? Two, given that the application is now in doubt, what will happen to the $100,000 allocated uh, towards that grant uh, if it's not given to the original recipient? And three, given that the role of the local development commissions is to bring the element of local knowledge and content to the process, and there was media coverage of this issue prior to the grant round closing, yet the issue was still missed. Will the minister undertake to restoring development commissions to staffing levels that will allow them to undertake their role more effectively? Good question. Minister for Regional Development. The member for the uh, question. The applications for REGS grants uh, require applicants to provide details of all partners, directors and senior management in the business who are applying for a grant. In this instance, a sole director was listed and this was not the person referred to in the WA Today article. Accountability and credibility of, list of, of the listed applicants is taken, is determined using local knowledge and where relevant credit checks are also undertaken. In the Pilbara, the assessment of applications involves up to three assessors providing comment on the suitability of the project and the proponent. The full application as well as an overview of the project and recommendations from the assessors are then presented to the Board of Commission for final approval. Two, any, un any unallocated grant funds are made available for future red grant rounds. We now understand that Ms Vandenberg uh, had stood down from the management of the company prior to the Commission or myself becoming aware of the uh, charges. Uh, I note that the project was assessed very highly by the Commission for its potential economic benefits, including long-term tourism jobs for Aboriginal people on the borough. Three, applications to round three red grants closed on 7 July and the, and the assessment of the applications began on the 8th of July. The Commission is unaware of any ready reports uh, naming the person identified in the article prior to the 12th of August. There are currently eight staff in the Commission's Carrather office, which is similar to the staffing levels under the previous government. Um, the member will be aware that under the previous government, much of the Pilbara Development Commission staff were based in Perth. I note the Commission's recent stakeholder survey with over 100 responses showing very positive results across all indicators, suggesting uh, they are well engaged and well regarded in the Pilbara. The Honourable Colin Holt. Development. I refer to question without notice 1318 asked on the 24th of November and I ask, one, what role does the Minister for Regional Development play in the market-led proposal process? Two, has the Minister played any role in assessing or presenting the Bustleton Jetty MLP application? If so, what has been her involvement? 
Three, the proponent has been told that the proposal has been on the Minister for Regional Development's desk now for nine months, waiting for her to take it to Cabinet. A, is this true and what has been the hold up in taking it to Cabinet? And B, why has the assessment and lack of notification of the Bustle and Jenny MLP Father Steering Committee's own 99-day notice period? Minister for Regional Development. Under the market-led proposal guidelines, the lead agency minister is responsible for presenting a cabinet submission on the findings of the market-led proposal steering committee. Uh, my involvement in the assessment of the Bustleton Jetty Incorporated application process has been consistent with the guidelines. Three, I acknowledge that this process, this proposal, has not progressed as quickly as the proponent would have liked. However, as per the terms of the MLP policy, I'm not in a position to disclose information on the process. The Honourable Rick Mazza. Thank you, Madam President. Um, my question without notice, of which some notice is given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Emergency Services. I refer to the November 12, 2020 Farm Weekly article, Government Agrees with Most Fire Recommendations, in which the Minister said the State Government will seek to undertake a review of communication capabilities in the Esperance region and investigate flexible and mobile solutions that provide digital radio communications and enhance Wi-Fi and phone coverage. He added the State Government recognised that current technology is limited in its capacity to service growing demand, so I ask one. When will the review into Esperance communications capabilities commence? Two, how long will the review last? And three, in the meantime, what is the Government doing to improve communication capabilities in the Esperance region. Minister for the Environment. Thank you very much, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some notes to the question. One, the review and identification for an additional radio repeater site in the Esperance North East region is currently underway. Two, the review is scheduled for completion in June 2021, with works to commence in the 2021-22 financial year. Three, the State Government is enhancing emergency communications networks across the state. In partnership with DBCA, an additional radio repeater was installed at Peak Charles in June 2020 to improve radio communications in the northern part of the Esperance local government area. DFES is testing, up, testing upgrading mobile satellite capabilities to improve communications in remote areas. The Commonwealth Government has primary responsibility for telecommunications. The State Government has raised with the Commonwealth the need for improved telecommunications in WA. DFES is currently working with NBN and the Strengthening Telecommunications Communications Against Natural Disasters program to install satellite-based Wi-Fi services at 21 community evacuation centres, local government buildings and emergency services buildings in high-risk isolated communities by December 2020, with a further 55 locations across the state to receive satellite services in 2021. Aaron My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Local Government, Heritage, Culture and the Arts. I refer the Minister to the response he gave in the other place on the 4th of April 2019 in relation to the Local Government Act review, and specifically to his comments that the Government intended to, and I quote, create a green bill that we can further consult on before we bring landmark reform legislation to Parliament in the near future. Given that 18 months have passed, and we are now heading into an election in which jobs and local economy will be central. And given that the local government sector now accounts for approximately $4 billion of economic throughput across, the, across Western Australia each year, I ask, one, what stage is the Green Bill currently at? And two, since it will not now be tabled prior to Parliament rising, is the Minister able to table at least an executive summary of its proposed provisions so that the electors of Western Australia know what they can expect in this space from any future government of which he or his colleagues might be a part? Leader of the House. The Honourable Member, for some notice of the question, one to two, the details of the Local Government Green Bill will be provided when the bill is finalised and released for public consultation. The Honourable Colin Tinknell. Question without notice, of which some notice is given. This is to the Minister for Regional Development regarding Collie Industrial Land. In reference to a question without notice, 1295 on the 11th of November, noting a land reference in the answer, the shot strategic industrial area is available for mining related industry only. The land in Kemerton is not within the Shire of Collie, and the land in Collie Light industrial area is not available for heavy industry. Noting this government's stated commitment to diversifying the economy of Collie region, one I ask, can the Minister outline what plans the Government has, if any, to address the land, the lack of land available in the Collie Shire for either lease or purchase for the operation of job creating heavy industry not directly relating to mining sector? Minister for Regional Development. I 
thank the member for the question. And member, um, some months ago, the uh, uh, Collins Steering Committee resolved, uh, and I think uh, had that uh, approved by Cabinet, uh, to proceed to change uh, the uh, the zoning for uh, that heavy industrial site. So, so currently, it uh, is just related. Uh, it needs to be a coal-related heavy industry, uh, and we are now going through that process of advertising the change to the uh, local planning scheme, because we agree that there, it should not be limited uh, to coal. So that process is um, underway at the moment, and the comment period uh, closes on the 18th of January. Um, but of course, if anyone in the meantime is applying and looking at that, we are going to be treating this as if that is uh, that has already gone. Um, uh, in addition, the South West Development Commission has uh, commissioned an engineering and assessment for current and potential industrial land in and around Collie. Uh, the assessment seeks to identify the current capability and constraints on industrial land, including access to water, power, wastewater, and to inform the potential industry attraction and development strategies. And uh, that additional, which has been going on for some time, uh, is also due to be completed in January 2021. Uh, and, uh, and as the member would be aware, we have already invested, um, um, uh, I would say, in excess of uh, uh, $50 million in that diversification project and, and some of those that are showing great success, in particular uh, the West Track uh, um, Pearson Tini propose a project, um, but there are many more underway. The Honourable Alison Zamon. And my question without notice, which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Environment. I refer to the request the Minister made in 2018 that the EPA review the implementation conditions regarding greenhouse gases on the Wheatstone Development Ministerial Statement 873 and Gorgon Gas Development Ministerial Statement 800, and I ask one. Can the Minister please advise when each of these reports are expected to be completed? Two, will the Minister please confirm that these reports will both be released in full to the public upon completion? And three, will the Minister commit to requiring these projects comply with any recommendations the EPA might make regarding greenhouse gas emission reductions. Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notes of the question. One, the Environmental Protection Authority, EPA, published its report on its inquiry into Condition 26 of Ministerial Statement 800 for the Gorgon Gas Development Revised and Expanded Proposal in September 2019. Ministerial, Ministerial Statement 1136 was subsequently released in May 2020. With regard to my request for an inquiry into Ministerial Statement 873 for Wheatstone development, I am advised that the EPA is still conducting its inquiry and is expecting to report in mid-2021. Two, yes, the Environmental Protection Act 1986, the EPA Act, requires that EPA reports on inquiries made under Section 46 are published. Three, for the Wheatstone development, I will consider the EPA's advice and recommendation and consult with other decision-making authorities in accordance with the EPA Act before making my decision on the implementation conditions. This is the statutory process that was followed in issuing Ministerial Statement 1136 for the amendment to Condition 26 for the Gorgon Gas Development Revised and Expanded Proposal. The Honourable Tim Clifford. President, my question about notice of which some notice has been given is to the Minister uh, for the Environment representing the Minister for Transport. And I ask one, could the Minister advise how the McGowan government plans to transition the Transperth bus fleet to full electric? Um, or does the McGowan government policy still stand as per question about notice 127 that the government has no plans to transition the fleet away from diesel? And two, could the Minister advise how the recent 10-year contract with Volvo to supply 900 diesel buses the Transperth fleet is in line with the McGowan government's aspiration of net zero emissions by 2050. Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President, I thank the honourable member for some notes of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Transport. One, on the 2nd of July 2020, the McGowan government announced that a trial of electric buses will be undertaken on the Joondalup cart route. Work is currently underway to upgrade the Joondalup depot to facilitate this trial, which is expected to commence from early 2022. Following this trial, further decisions can be made as to the deployment of further electric buses. 2A not applicable. Two, sorry, 1A not applicable. Two, as per the 2nd of July 2020 media statement, the contract allows for the provision of alternative technology. The Honourable Steve Thomas. Uh, thank you, Madam President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister of the Environment representing the Treasurer. I refer to the 2018-19 to 2020-21 mini boom of iron ore royalties and ask one, what is the current spot price of iron ore as measured by the government? Two, 
what, iron ore, what amount of iron ore royalty income has the government received for 2021 financial year to date? Three, how much higher is the answer to two than the income that would have been received if the iron ore price had averaged 2021 budget price of US $96.60 a tonne? And four, has the government modelled the fiscal impact of an iron ore price over $100 US a tonne for 2021, or would such an assumption be considered highly unrealistic? Minister for the Environment. And I thank the honourable member for some answer to the question. One, uh, US 127.85 cents per tonne. Two, an update will be provided in the, in the 2020 2021 mid year review. Three, see response to question two. Four, the honourable member does not seem to understand the key but basic point that iron ore prices are highly volatile. Yeah. As the honourable member has been informed on previous occasions, this government makes no apologies for its conservative revenue assumptions. It will not repeat the mistakes of the previous Liberal national government in assuming high revenue assumptions when there is a very high level of uncertainty. It was this reckless approach that delivered nine budgets with nine cash deficits, totalling $27.8 billion. The Honourable Martin Aldridge. Well President, my question without notice, which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development. I refer to the annual report 2019-20 of the Regional Development Trust and ask one, has the Trust provided advice to you in 2019-20 or from 1 July 2020 to date under the Section 12A? of the Royalties for Regions Act 2009, if so, please table that advice. Two, have you sought the advice of the Trust in 2019-20 or from 1 July 2020 to date under Section 12B of the Royalties for Regions Act 2009, if so, please table the request and the advice received. Three, I refer to the membership of Ms Gail Reynolds-Adamson on the Trust satisfying Section 13 1A of the Act and noting that Ms Reynolds-Adamson only attended one of five Trust meetings in 2019-20 but still received her full remuneration of $11,309.83. What explanation can be provided for this? And for how are regional development commissions being adequately represented on the regional development trust in these circumstances? The Minister for Regional Development. Uh, I thank the um, member for the question uh, and uh, uh, advise that um, no formal advice has been requested or provided, but the chair of the trust has kept me abreast of, uh, of their uh, activities, and the trust uh, certainly continues to lead a greater collaboration across the regional development portfolio, uh, including the alignment of strategic themes and planning. This uh, a greater degree, degree of integration was highlighted during uh, our response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and certainly uh, the Trust is providing thought leadership in terms of regional uh, development generally across the state. Uh, three, remuneration and allowances are provided in accordance with uh, Section 20 of the Royalties for Regions Act 2009, while Ms Reynolds Adamson's other commitments made it difficult for her to attend meetings, I am advised she was still able to contribute to the work of the Trust. Um, Ms uh, Reynolds Adamson uh, was appointed only for one year. Uh, four, the Chair of the Regional Development Trust is also Chair of the Pilbara Development Commission Board um, and a member of the Regional Development Council, so I consider uh, that the Development Commissions are adequately represented on the Regional Development Trust. The Honourable Robin Chappell. I have a question without notice, uh, of which some notice has been given uh, to the Minister of Environment. I refer to the Quabba Ganalu Road in Carnarvon, recommended by the Department of Parks and Wildlife, uh, Depor, uh, to remain closed until 2023. Depor's correspondence with the Shire and the outcomes of the Shire meeting, and I ask, is the Minister aware that the Shire intends to reopen the road as an adventure track without reinforcing or protecting the track or surrounds? And is the Minister aware that the track runs through the National Heritage Place ID uh, number 105881? Uh, is the Minister aware that the track was closed in, 19, in the 1960s due to safety concerns? Four, is the Minister aware that the surrounding dunes have been damaged as a result of irresponsible 4x4 use? Five, given that this is a National Heritage listed area, Will the minister ensure that such inappropriate activity will be rejected by the department? And six, if notified, why not? Minister for the Environment. 
to the question one to six, the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions, or DBCA, and Ningaloo Coast Joint Management Body have provided advice to the Shire of Carnarvon regarding the reopening of the road. This has included a suggested roadmap to address cultural, safety and environmental concerns associated with reopening the road and requesting an extension of the road closure period for five years until these matters are resolved. However, whilst DBCA has management responsibility for the adjacent Ningaloo Coastal Reserves, the Shire of Carnarvon has management responsibility for the road. The Hon. Uh, the Hon. Diane Evers. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Forestry. I refer to the Forest Management Regulation 1993 Part 2 Registration of Timber Workers, and I ask, one, how many workers are currently registered to engage in timber harvesting in a state forest or timber reserve? Two, how many workers are currently registered to engage in the transport of log timber harvested in a state forest or timber reserve? And three, how many workers are registered for both timber harvesting and the transport of log timber? Minister for Regional Development. I thank the member for the question. The following information has been provided by the Minister for Forestry. One to three, 792 timber workers are currently registered to engage in timber harvesting in the State Forest or Timber Reserve or in the transport of log timber harvested in a State Forest or Timber Reserve. The FPC register is maintained in accordance with the Forest Management Regulations 1993, which do not require registration for harvesting and transport activities to be recorded separately. The Honourable Robin Scott. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for the Environment, representing the Treasurer and Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. I refer to the state budget and the three quarters of a billion dollars to be spent on, and I quote, enhancing Aboriginal wellbeing package. I ask one, how will the success of this package be measured? Two, who will be accountable for any failures? And three, if the outcomes for Aboriginal people don't improve, will the government stand by its policy of avoiding intervention and continue instead with its partnership model? Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One to three. The Western Australian Government is making a record investment in Aboriginal communities to progress its commitment to building the resilience and, ca and capacity of Aboriginal people and communities. The WA Government is a signatory to the National Ag Agreement on Closing the Gap, and the comprehensive reporting requirements under this agreement will capture the majority of commitments for socio-economic change for Aboriginal communities through one consolidated reporting mechanism. This government is committed to reset, resetting the relationship between the state and Aboriginal communities and working in partnership to improve outcomes for Aboriginal people. The Honourable Colin de Brusa. Madam President, uh, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Water. I refer to the determination of spring rights as it applies to surface water irrigators in the Manjimup Pemberton Irrigation District. And I ask one. Why are some farmers with previously approved spring rights now being told they no longer have spring rights? Two, why are farmers with an A-class water licence now being told they need a licence again when they were previously told they didn't need a licence due to spring rights? And three, given that catchments are fully allocated in the region, when will this quagmire of uncertainty be resolved and how will this be communicated to all in the region? Minister for Regional Development. Um, I thank the uh, member for the, uh, for the question uh, and uh, the following uh, uh, information has been provided by the Minister for Water. Uh, the questions uh, contain uh, a certain number of uh, misconceptions. Firstly, one of the deficiencies of the current legislation, which was not remedied by the previous government, is that there is no formal process for farmers to get a definitive declaration that they have a spring right. Uh, De Wer has put in place a voluntary process, a voluntary process to assist, uh, to assist farmers. Um, and uh, we, are, we believe that, uh, uh, that it is going to be necessary uh, to modernise water management in West Australia, including uh, improving processes around establishing a spring right. 
Uh, but Minister Kelly has advised that his office is willing to meet with anyone um, who has a concern. And, Member, I would be um, more than prepared to uh, organise a briefing for you with, uh, with Minister Kelly to go through the detail. Well, thank you, Madam President. My question, without notice of which some notice is given, is to the Minister for Environment, representing the Minister for Planning. And I again refer to the draft Swan Valley Plan scheme, or the scheme that was published for public comment from 14 October until 14 November 2020. And I ask one: To what degree was the City of Swan consulted on the draft scheme prior to its publication? On what dates, with whom did that consultation occur, and what specific written advice was provided to your departmental officers? And how was that advice incorporated into the draft scheme? Two, how many public and or private comments were received throughout the consultation process? Three, will these comments be published and if not, why not? And four, will the minister be afforded adequate time to contemplate and where possible incorporate those comments, including those representations made by business following the closure of the public comment period before the scheme is gazetted? Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President. And I thank the honourable member for some notes to the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Planning. One, the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage engages extensively with the City of Swan um, and has received feedback from City staff on the draft Swan Valley Planning Scheme. At a recent Council meeting, the City resolved to recommend support for the draft scheme, with four modifications suggested. The City's recommendation will help inform the final scheme. Two, 76 submissions have been received. Three, a schedule of submissions will be made available on the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage website once the scheme has been finalised. And four, yes. The Hon. Ken Baston. My question without notice, with some notice, is given is, uh, to the Minister representing the Minister for Police. I refer to the ABC article published online on the 25th of November reporting that 40 cars have been stolen in the last 30 days in Broome and the upcoming Community Safety Forum posted by the Shire of Broome and, and on Monday, the 7th of December. And I ask, one, will the Minister please advise who of the following will be in attendance at this forum? A, Government MPs, B, Government Ministers, C, Department Director Generals, and D, Government Agency Representatives. Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some knowledge of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. One, from the police portfolio, Acting Assistant Commissioner Darrell Gaunt and relevant Kimberley Police District personnel will attend. Information regarding other attendees would need to be requested from the relevant minister or the Shire. Uh, Leader of the House. The business of the House is resumed. Are there any further answers from any minister? The Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. Uh, on behalf of the Minister for Community Services, I'd like to table the Target 120 Evaluation Progress Report in relation to the Honourable Colin Ticknell's question uh, without notice 1274, asked on the uh, 11th of November 2020. And Those documents are tabled. I think there's something underneath. Da, 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 da. Oh, no. Same thing. Are there any further answers, the Minister for the Environment? Thanks very much, Madam President. Uh, I would like to provide answers in relation to the following questions without notice and seek leave to have them incorporated into hindsight. So, 1219, asked by the Honourable Tim, Tim Clifford, uh, asked on the 4th of November 2020 to the Minister for Energy. 1307, asked by the Honourable Peter Collier. 1312, asked by the Honourable, the Honourable Martin Aldridge on the 24th of November to the Minister for Police. And 1281, asked by the Honourable Colin de Grusser on the 11th of November. Uh, which I also table the attached document. That document's tabled. Uh, I might put those separately because I, there may very well be different answers for different questions. Who knows? Um, so the, minute, the first one, Minister, was for. Uh, 1219, asked by the Honourable Tim Clifford. OK, um, if you just wait a second. The Minister seeks leave to incorporate that information into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister, the second one. Uh, the Honourable. Peter Collier, 1307, it says. Oh, sorry, I've got two. 1355, uh, 5. sorry, the number's wrong on my thing. Minister seeks leave to incorporate that answer into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Aye. Leave is granted. Minister? Sorry, I think they've used the different numbers. It is 1355. It's the one you wanted. Uh, sorry, the Honourable. Um, uh, 1347, asked by the Honourable Martin Aldridge to the Minister for Police. Yeah, it is granted. The Minister seeks leave to incorporate that answer into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Are there any further answers? And the Honourable Colin de Grusser, uh, 1309, asked by the Honourable Colin de Grusser to me, representing the Minister for Emergency Services. Minister on... seeks leave to incorporate that answer into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Aye. Leave is granted. And with that one, Madam President, I 
there's an attachment and that, to it. And that document is tabled. Are there any further answers, the Minister for the Environment? Thanks, Madam President. Uh, I table documents in relation to question on notice number 3406 asked by the Hon. Diane Everest. That document is tabled. Are there any further answers by any minister, the Minister for Regional Development? Uh, thank you. Um, I table documents in relation to questions on notice numbers 3345 asked by the Hon. Robin Chapel, 3376 and 3387 asked by the Hon. Alison Simon and 3410 asked by the Hon. Diane Evers. Those documents are tabled. Are there any further answers by any minister? or Parliamentary Secretary? No? The Honourable...